you ahead of when the story should be told. But I'll give you a hint. It's about the Ten Commandments. After that, I'm going to tell about a hated tax collector named Zacchaeus and what happened when he met Jesus. And I must say that this is the rundown of a very important show. Of immediate importance to me and to you is our first story. And you can find it in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus. Exodus means a going out. And it is a word used for a lot of people leaving a place like, like here is the Exodus from a town being raided by killer bulls. Or this is the exodus every evening of the commuters from the city. But this word exodus has a particular meaning because it is a word that has come down to us from history and its real and particular and original meaning was this trip that I'm going to tell you about, the journey of the children of Israel. The Bible tells us there were more than 600,000 of them out from Egypt and through the Sinai desert on their way to the promised land. And now let the story of the exodus and the Ten Commandments begin. We pick up the children of Israel, all 600,000 of them, as they follow Moses across the desert to the Sinai Peninsula. The weather was terrible. It was hot. No clouds. The sun beat down. No trees for shade. Nothing but sand, sand, and more sand. Blazing sand. And the sand was full of serpents, snakes, and scorpions. Three days out of Egypt, they had hardly any food left and no more water. Just jewelry that they'd gotten from the Egyptians, and you can't drink a zircon. I didn't like being a slave. But I'm not sure about this wilderness living. I hope this Moses guy knows what he's doing. Hey, everybody, come here. Wet your whistle, it's water. This tastes like mice died here. After a drink of that water, I need a drink of water. Moses, what do we do now? Wait a minute. I'll have to ask the Lord. Lord, what do I do now? Moses, take this tree and throw it into the water, and it will make the water sweet. And Moses did what God told him to do, and the tree made the water sweet, and the children of Israel drank of it. Wow. What a difference. This new water really hits the spot. Yes, this water really cures thirst. The Lord provides none better. Check it out. And God then led them to a place called Elim, which had 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees. And all the children of Israel camped there by the waters until they didn't anymore because it was time to move on into the wilderness of sin where conditions were worse than before. Out of the frying pan, and into the frying pan. It's now a month and a half since I left Egypt and things are worse than ever. If I was going to die in Egypt, at least I would die with food in my stomach. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Do I remember the luscious leeks, succulent onions, the juicy cucumbers, the mouth-watering garlic of Egypt. And I remember sitting next to the cooking meat and smelling it and waiting to eat it. Yes, I remember the flesh pots of Ramses. Moses, I'm starving to death. What are you going to do about it? Wait a minute. I'll have to ask. Lord, what do I do now? Tell the children of Israel that I have heard their complaints and tell them that I shall provide. Tell them that in the evening they shall eat meat and in the morning, I will rain bread from heaven, and then they shall know that I am the Lord their God. Thank you, God. And that night, the wind blew hordes of quail from the coast over the mountains, and they fell amidst the children of Israel in the wilderness of sin. And in the morning, manna fell from heaven. Manna fell every morning from then on. 
<laughs> Jubilee, Jubilee, the Lord my God has provided. Mm. This is an interesting food. We call it manna. You call it, what is it? In English, the word manna means, what is it? You don't know what it is? We don't know what it is. It's mystery stuff, but we make a steady diet of it. All kinds of ways to prepare. Look, you can eat it just as it comes off the ground. Mm. You can boil it, bake it, roast it, fry it, toast it, eat it cold, eat it hot. We look upon this as all purpose food. One day it's manna roast. The next day it's manna with cream. For a change, salted manna. What's it like? Hard to say. Sweet like honey, white like coriander. What's that? How does it compare to a steak? <laughs> you must be kidding. Well, we're moving on. I guess I'll go too. I don't want to be left behind. Now, thanks to God's bounty, the children of Israel were eating regularly, but water was still a problem. So once again, the children of Israel succumbed to doubt and went crazy with thirst. At Rephidim, it all got too much for them. They started complaining again. Oh, show us the way to the next water hall. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. For we must find the next water hole. For if we don't find the next water hole, I tell you, we must die. Shh. God will hear you. Why do you tempt him like this? He has provided in the past. We must have faith that he will provide again. Children, you must grow up. We can't grow up if we don't live long enough. Oh, show us the way to the next water hole. Oh, don't ask why. Oh, don't ask why. For we must find the next water hole. For if we don't find the next water hole, I tell you, we must die. Lord, what shall I do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. Moses, take your staff and tap the rock, and water will come out of it. Tap water. All right, come and get it. But remember that you have tempted the Lord and doubted him, and no good will come of it. And no good did come of it. The dread and fierce Amalekites attacked. Moses stood on a mountain nearby watching, and the power of God was in him. As long as he kept his arms raised, the children of Israel were winning. But when he let his arms drop, the battle turned in favor of the Amalekites. After a while, his arms grew very weary and very heavy. Helpers came who held up his arms till the fight was over, and the Israelites were triumphant. After that, it was up in the morning and out on the trail till finally, three months out of Egypt, they reached Mount Sinai. The children of Israel camped here and Moses went up the mountain to hear God's words and to learn what God had in mind for the children of Israel. Now pay close attention because this was the first and the greatest summit conference of all time. Moses, yes God. Tell the children of Israel that I have brought them out of bondage in Egypt and that I have carried them on eagles' wings through the wilderness and now they are at my place, Mount Sinai. And tell them that if they agree to obey my laws, I will make them a special treasure to me above all other people. Yes, Lord. And then God told Moses the Ten Commandments. The following laws are the Ten Commandments, Moses. Listen carefully. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make any sculptured image, nor shalt thou bow down to them or serve them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. 
Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet anything that is thy neighbor's. And God gave Moses other laws, and when he was finished, he made the big promise. And Moses, tell the children of Israel that if they make this agreement with me, I will lead them to the promised land and make it theirs. Yes, God, I will carry your message to the people. I'll wait here. And Moses told the children of Israel what God had said, and the children of Israel agreed right away. We agree to everything. Count on us. Yes. Okay, sure thing. D'accord, d'accord. I'll buy that. Sounds great to me. Terrific. Is that definite? Yes, Moses. All the Lord has said we will do, and we will be obedient, too. Then the bargain is sealed. Then Moses went back up the mountain. God gave Moses the complete technical specifications for building his tabernacle and for worshiping him down to the tiniest detail. And when he was finished, God wrote the Ten Commandments down on tablets of stone. God wrote them with his own hand. And all this took 40 days and 40 nights. Meanwhile, down below, the children of Israel grew apprehensive and afraid. I think we can close the Moses file. Let's look at the facts. He went up into the mountain three weeks ago. He wasn't carrying any food, certainly not enough food or water to last as long as he's been there. Fact. He hasn't come down or sent a message. That. This is a mysterious mountain with fire, smoke, and rumblings. I say there are beasts up there. Fact. Is it too far-fetched to say that Moses has been eaten by a unicorn? Fact. We've been abandoned by Moses and his God. We need a new God. The children of Israel collected all their earrings and tossed them into a great pot. The earrings were melted down and molded into the shape of a calf, a golden calf. This became the new god of the children of Israel, and they became abandoned and danced before it. What followed has been accurately defined as a freakout. So the children of Israel had gone and done exactly what they had promised not to do. They were worshiping another god, and the Lord was angry. He sent Moses down from the mountain to tell them to stop it and to get them on the right track. children ye have sinned a great sin i have caught you red-handed worshiping a false god repent 
or the Lord will destroy you. <laughs> Forgive us. Forgive us. We repent. We repent. Moses went back to the Lord and told them that the people were sorry, that he, Moses, would give his life for them, and he begged God to forgive them for what they had done. And God forgave them, and he put the commandments on two new pieces of stone. And the children of Israel stripped themselves of all their jewelry as a sign of repentance, and never wore it anymore. Later, they donated most of it to make the holy tabernacle and the holy altar of God, which preceded them for the rest of their journey. And now, let us continue on to the promised land. And that's what they did. Actually, the children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for another 40 years, that's two generations, before they entered the Promised Land. And Moses himself never got there, but he did get to see it just before he died at the ripe old age of 120 years because that's the way God wanted it. Now, the first city that the children of Israel came to when they did enter the Promised Land was the city of Jericho. And that's where our next story takes place quite a few years later. It's the story of Zacchaeus from the New Testament, the book of Luke, chapter 19. As I said, it takes place in Jericho, which is, by the way, the oldest known city in the world. It was settled around 8,000 BC, sometime in the late Stone Age, after the sheep was domesticated, but before the goat was. And it is still a city today. At the time our story takes place, Jericho had been transformed by the King Herod into the great and magnificent Roman city. And Jesus had come there to preach. At that time, Jesus was traveling about healing and preaching. One of his main messages was, Sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Remember that. And now meet Zacchaeus, citizen of Jericho, publican, tax collector, cheat, social pariah, and fashion plate. Also a very short man. I'm a big man around here. I'm the tax collector. When I collect the taxes, I always think IRS, which stands for I reject silver. Gold only, that's all I take. Maybe platinum or stones, but they have to be of good quality. IRS also means I represent success. Maybe you think it's easy being a tax collector. Ha! Ah, I repeat, ha, ah, ha. Ah. I'm the guy on the front lines. I mean, I'm the guy who has to squeeze the people. Look, it works this way. The Roman government, which owns the world, has tax collecting franchises, which they sell to independent contractors like me. And I pay out of my own pocket for that. I pay Rome 5,000 shekels. Then I got to take in maybe 50,000 to make that back meet my expenses, show a profit, keep my growth rate on an upward swing. It's a hard life, and I can't get no sympathy, no way. So why do people hate me? I don't understand. After all, I'm on top, ain't I? Knock, knock. Who's there? Ira. Ira who? I regret that I've come to pay my taxes. Oh, sure, come right in. You can't be too careful these days, you know. Hello. I'm here to be squeezed dry. I don't like it, but I have no choice. Okay, how much are you going to hurt me? What are damages? I'm ready for the worst. Okay, we'll begin. There are two sure things in this world. Death and taxes, which brings me to the death tax, which I must collect from you now because you won't be able to give it to me when you're dead. 50 shekels. Were you born? Yes. 
Okay, birth tax. You owe me 35 shekels. How did you get here? I walked. Okay, walking tax, 75 shekels. I have an apple. Okay, there's an eating tax, 25 shekels. <clears throat> I'm going to tax your memory. 50 shekels. You're taxing my patience. That's the next item. Patience tax. 60 shekels. I'm getting short on patience. Okay. 35 shekels. You owe me an empty pocket tax. And that was Zacchaeus. During this time, Jesus was preaching among the people and going out of his way to reach the out-of-the-way people, the ostracized, the shunned, the loathed, the outcast, the smallest, the humblest, the poorest, the weakest. And he was coming to Jericho to preach. Zacchaeus himself, an out-of-the-way person, ostracized, shunned, loathed, and an outcast, was curious. I'm really curious to see this Jesus person. They say he talks to tax collectors. Well, I've even heard that one of his disciples, a lovely fellow by the name of Matthew, is a tax collector. I'm a tax collector, so maybe he'll talk to me. But many other people had the same idea, and a large crowd turned out to see Jesus. Because he was so short, Zacchaeus had a hard time seeing through the crowd. Oh, look, look, Zacchaeus is trying to see Jesus. What does he want with Jesus? He has some nerve to come out here amongst decent people. I hope he falls off that ladder and breaks every bone in his body. Oh, Alistair, look. It's Jesus. He's stopping here. Zacchaeus? Yes, Jesus? Zacchaeus, make haste and come down. For today I must abide at thy house. Yes, Jesus. I'll be right down. Welcome to my home, Jesus. Well, that beats everything. How can Jesus go and be the guest of a man who is a sinner? Well, I don't know. And Jesus went and dined at the home of Zacchaeus, the hated tax collector. Meeting Jesus, being in his presence and talking with him, had an amazing effect on Zacchaeus. Oh, I have seen the error of my ways. I've been a terrible sinner, but now I'm going to correct that. The whole Lord, half of my goods I'll give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man falsely, I'll restore to him fourfold. Jesus was pleased. Zacchaeus, I am pleased. This day is salvation come to this house. For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. And thus Zacchaeus was saved. After the guests had gone, the glow on Zacchaeus remained. He called the people he had cheated. Ira, get over here right away. There's a matter I have to take up with you. But we took care of everything. I got no time. Just get over here. Alistair, get Hillary and get over here right away. And bring the twins. Tell all the poor people to get over here right away, too. And Zacchaeus made good on his redemption. Come and get it. Half everything I have is yours. Here, take my keys, please. Everybody who was cheated, 
You get four times what you lost. Here's more. Everything I have, take it on. Stand back. Here's my sleeve. Well, Marsh, you really tell some swell story. Let's hear another. What else are you going to cover? Hold on there, Buster Blue. And you too, Malcolm. We're at the end of the show. All we have left are the goodbyes and the so long. No, Marsh. Please stay and tell me one more story. There's no more time. No more, I tell you. Can't you get that through your leather head? <laughs> you too, Malcolm. Well, if there aren't any more stories, I think I'll go inside and watch TV. <whistles> Come on, Malcolm. <whistles> well, Buster Blue has gone inside his shoe, and I think I'll head towards home. I'm so glad you caught the show. Please keep watching. So long. I'll see you. Goodbye. CBS News has presented Marshall Efron's Illustrated, Simplified, and Painless Sunday School. think she's a real person. She's genuine. The Morning Program. Watch it following Thomas this. Williams, Director of Community Affairs, WCBS-TV, 513 West 56th Street, New York, New York, 10019. If you visited a place that looked like this, what would you think of the people who live there? New York, let's clean up New York. Last summer, thousands of New Yorkers replaced their air conditioners. The smart ones bought energy-efficient models. If you're thinking of replacing your air conditioner, look for one with an energy efficiency rating of 9 or higher. It will keep you comfortable and save you money on your electric bills. For more information, call Con Edison's Project Save. Con Edison, the energy of New York. Can you solve the puzzle on Wheel of Fortune weeknights at 7.30? CBS News presents Marshall Efron's Illustrated, Simplified, and Painless Sunday School. Here's a barrel of monkeys. Let there be monkey business. I said monkey business. That's better. Keep busy, boys and girls. They work for peanuts. I work for bananas. Which one of us is smarter? No, this is not animal world, nor is it ape unto my feet. And you're not going to hear anything about the habits of the great auk, the northern elk, or any of their ilk. Hi. <laughs> this is Marshall Efron, and today I'm going to tell you the illustrated story of the wisdom of Solomon, give you a simplified guide to the 12 apostles, and present a painless parable, the parable of the two debtors. Our first story is about the late, great, and very famous King Solomon, and it's found in the Old Testament in the first book of Kings, chapter 3. Solomon is and was very famous for. For what? What was he famous for? He was famous for a lot of things. He was famous for building the great temple of the Jews. He was famous for his gorgeous home, which was a palace, and he wrote two of the books in the Old Testament the Book of Proverbs, and the Song of Solomon. But mostly, 
He was famous for his wisdom. People came from all over to hear him speak his mind. They even made a movie about that, called it King Solomon's Mind. How did he get to be so wise and so great? Well, you hang around and find out. Our story comes in two acts. Act one, how God granted wisdom to Solomon, and act two, how Solomon used that wisdom and proved he was wise. In act one, we pick him up early in his reign in the city of Gibeon, where he has been making sacrifices to God in high places. Mm. Oh, the sacrifices I make for my country. 10,000 burnt offerings today alone. I'm going to my room. I've got to get some sleep. <clears throat> sure is rough being the new king in town. One day you're just an ordinary prince, just another pebble on the beach. And then that night you're crowned, and there you are next day, and on your throne room door they hang a star, star of David. Oh, speaking of David, my dad David was such a great king. How do you follow an act like that? <laughs> and now for a nightcap. <laughs> all these decisions. Every day I have all these decisions to make. Boy, I, I hope I'm good enough. Gee, I'm all keyed up. <sighs> I hope I can sleep. Solomon, Solomon, this is God speaking to you in a dream. You're sleeping now. But later on, when you're awake, you'll remember what I'm telling you now when you're sleeping. Oh, God, I'm so glad that you've answered my prayers and sacrifices. Tell me what it is that you want me to give you. Lord, you have made me king over your people, a great people who number in the multitudes, the thousands, if not hundreds. And I am so inexperienced. I am but a little child. I don't even know how to go out or come in. Solomon, just tell me what it is you want me to give you. Oh, yes, Lord. Please give your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may know the difference between good and evil. I'm very pleased with that response. You could have asked for a lot of things. Long life, riches, the destruction of your enemies. But you have asked for an understanding heart. Solomon, don't despair. It is done. I am giving you an understanding heart and wisdom. And I am giving you those things you did not ask for. Riches. And honor. There will never be another like you. There will never be another you. If you keep my laws and my commandments and walk in my ways, then I will give you long life. Thank you, God. Solomon, good night. Pleasant dreams. Oh, what a night. I really feel refreshed. I really feel ready for the day. Thanks again, Lord. And now, let's get up and go to Jerusalem and offer some more burnt offerings there and offer peace offerings and offer such a feast to my servants they couldn't refuse. How Solomon used the wisdom God granted him and proved he was wise. All those 
who have business here stand before the bar of justice and plead your case. Let's take a look at the docket. What's the first case? Hmm. Mrs. Harrell versus Mrs. Otts. Child custody. Question of determination of parentage. Well, that should be easy. Are you Mrs. Uh, Harrell? Yes. Are you Mrs. Otts? Yes. Let me look at Mr. Baby here, see who he resembles. Well, they all look alike. So much for the powers of observation. Wisdom is called for. Let me hear the facts of the case. And remember, everyone must tell the truth. This is court. We're not messing around here. First, we'll hear from the complaining witness, Mrs. Harrell. My name is Mrs. Harrell, and this is my story, and I don't care who it hurts. This woman, Mrs. Ott, stole my baby. Mrs. Ott and I live in the same apartment. One King's Road, third floor, apartment 17. I had my baby first in the apartment, and three days later, she had hers in the apartment. I called my baby Carl, Carl Harrell, and she called her Scott, Scott Ott. Well, a couple of nights later, we were all asleep in our beds, me and Carl in mine, and Mrs. Ott and Scott in theirs. And Mrs. Ott accidentally smothered poor Scott and killed him. Well, I call that very careless, and I'm afraid for the safety of my own baby that she stole. That's a lie. That's a dirty lie. Order. Order. We'll have order in the court and no outbursts or demonstrations. Thank you. What she did then was to put poor little dead Scott in my bed and she took my Carl to her bed. In the morning, I woke up to a dead baby. Then I saw it was Scott. And then I saw Mrs. Ott had Carl. And that's why I'm here. <laughs> I want my baby back. I want my baby, that's all. <laughs> I want my baby. Thank you, Mrs. Harrow. I want my baby. Thank you, Mrs. Harrow. And now we're here for Mrs. Ott. That is my baby. You can't take Scott away from me. You'll pardon me, your effervescence, but her story is 100% fabrication. Her baby died, and now she wants to take my baby. This woman here is crazy, your most exalted corpulence. All you have to do is look at her. The defense rests. It's in your hands now, your most honored extremities. And remember, possession is nine-tenths of the law, and I do have possession. She lies! The baby is mine! Her baby is dead! The living baby is my baby! No, the living baby is my baby. Quiet, please. You'll wake your baby. Somebody wake up the baby. I can't think with that snoring. That's better. I want to think this out and come to a fair decision. This is my chance now to prove the wisdom God has given me. A difficult case like this is the perfect test. I'll review the facts. Fact one, this is not one of the most attractive babies I've ever seen. Fact two, you can't tell by looking at it who the mother is. Fact three, you can't ask it which woman is the mother. The baby doesn't speak yet. Fact four, one mother can have several children, but any given child can have but one mother. Let me think, let me think, let me think. I've got it. Tell Eddie the court swordsman to come in here and tell him to bring his sword. I've got a job for him. This is my judgment. Cut the baby in two and give one woman one half and one woman the other half. And that should settle it. Like work to me. No baby can survive that. Well, I think it's fair. I think there's a problem. Order! 
Order in the court. Let the judgment be carried out. Cut the baby in half. Oh, yes, let the judgment be carried out. I think it's fair. Oh, your majesty, don't kill the baby. She can have him, but please don't hurt him. That's what I wanted to hear. That's what I needed. Now I'll give the real true decision. Eddie, she's your sword. We won't harm a hair on the baby's head. The baby goes to Mrs. Harrow. Only a real mother who loved her baby would make a sacrifice like Mrs. Harrow. Thank you. Thank you, King Solomon the Wise. Solomon the Wise. King Solomon proved his wisdom to his people when he resolved the Harl Ott's case with its famous decision. And that was the story of how Solomon got his wisdom and proved it. And now, let's go ape and take a look at the 12 apostles. This segment is called 12 Apostles Made Memorable. The 12 apostles were the specially chosen disciples of Jesus Christ who were sent forth into the world to preach the message of Jesus. One thing about a banana, <clears throat> it's got a peel. Now, watch carefully and make sure that all 12 apostles are there, and that's an even dozen. Who is this man? That's a familiar face. Yes, that's Peter, sometimes called Simon. He and his brother Andrew were the first apostles called. They were fishermen, and they were fishing, casting their nets into the Sea of Galilee when Jesus saw them, recognized their special qualities, and said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. And the next two are the brothers James and John. After calling Peter and Andrew, Jesus saw James and John out fishing with their father, and he called them. Follow me, he said. Yeah, they were impetuous types, and they left their father's boat immediately and came to Jesus through the water, splashing and splashing, and followed him for the rest of their lives. These boys were not afraid to plunge right in, and Jesus called them the sons of thunder. Remember that. Okay, now we got four. Eight more to go. Who's this? Aha! This is Philip. Philip was called to be one of the apostles the day after Peter and Andrew and James and John were called. Jesus said to him, follow me, and Philip did. Philip was also a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee, and he came from the same town as Peter and Andrew. Now, Philip ran to his friend Nathaniel, who is known as Bartholomew, and told him of Jesus. And Bartholomew said, can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. And Bartholomew came and saw and was conquered. He became one of the apostles too. And here's Thomas, doubting Thomas, Thomas the skeptic, the man who needed proof. When Jesus appeared to the apostles after the crucifixion, Thomas was not with them and needed further proof, he said. So Jesus had to appear to him and Thomas touched the wounds of Jesus and then he was convinced that Jesus had come back. Jesus named him Matthew. His real name was Levi. Matthew was a publican. That means tax collector in anybody's language, except English. Because they worked for the Romans, tax collectors were considered by most people to be dishonest and therefore sinners. But Jesus tapped him and said, follow me. And Matthew followed. When the Pharisees saw Jesus with Matthew and some other tax collectors, they asked the disciples, why does your master eat with publicans and sinners? And Jesus heard the Pharisees and answered them. He said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. According to tradition, Matthew went on to write the book of Matthew. Now, let's see, that was eight apostles. Who's next? We've got a few more to go. Of course, it's the second James. According to one tradition, this James on the right looked so much like Jesus on the left that the high priest had to get Judas to point out which one was Jesus to the soldiers who came to arrest Jesus. Ah, but more of that later. Some people believe James wrote the epistle of James, one of the books of the New Testament. Okay, that's nine. Ah, Thaddeus, sometimes called Jude, is 10. 
This apostle is the brother of James, the apostle you just met a moment ago, and he is often thought of as being especially humble. He was frequently found in the company of Simon here, Simon the Canaanian. That's a different Simon from Simon called Peter. This Simon was simply called Simon. Simon called Peter is mostly called Peter. How many apostles have we named so far? 11, I believe. Ah, we're up to 12, and oh, it's Judas Iscariot, or Judas the scariest. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And here he is in the Garden of Gethsemane, identifying Jesus with a kiss, so the soldiers will know which man there was Jesus, and then arrest him. Ah, that's Matthias. Matthias was chosen by the apostles to replace Judas, which means he's the 13th apostle. So really, there's a baker's dozen. That's 12 plus one. Huh, this is a very famous painting of Jesus and the first 12 apostles before Matthias and just before Jesus' death. Can you pick out Judas in this picture? See, he's the one with his elbow on the table clutching those 30 pieces of silver. Bad manners. And what sort of men were these apostles that Jesus picked to help him preach and heal and work miracles? They were all types of men with only one thing in common, a great generosity. They were from the little country of Galilee, and most of them were poor. Like ourselves, they could be strong and faithful at times, and at others, they showed their weakness and failings. Of the 12, only one, John, stood at Jesus' cross. Nine fled, one denied him, one betrayed him, but in the end, they spent their lives carrying his message all over the world, and most of them were put to death in Jesus' name. Well, so much for the 13 original apostles. Let's switch now to one of them, Peter, and a story that Jesus told him, a story known as a parable. This parable is about forgiveness, what happens when you do and what happens when you don't. And it's found in the New Testament in the book of Matthew, chapter 18, starting at verse 21. See, Jesus was always talking about forgiveness and giving everybody a chance, so one day, Peter asked him, how often shall my brother sin against me and how often shall I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus answered, no, not seven times, better 70 times seven. Now that's what he said. And seven times 70 is 490 times, was then and is now. So you can see that's a lot of times and that's the point. Then Jesus told Peter a parable. That's a story with a point. the accountant king goes over the books. What's this? An outstanding account? How did this happen? Who is it? Uh, Cecil Sisney. And he owes me a hundred thousand dollars. That's remarkable. That's a truly outstanding debt. I'm surprised to find it here. My books have got to balance. Cecil Sisney is brought in. Oh, hell, Your Majesty. Nice day, isn't it? No, it isn't. My books don't balance. And whenever books don't balance, it's not a nice day. Can you read my figures? Yes. Where's the money you owe me? It was due two years ago. Didn't you get my check? My secretary said she sent it. There wasn't any check. There wasn't any check. When are you gonna pay up, Sisney? Give me a couple of days. You've had two years. Then what's two days? All right, two days, but that's it. Remember this, Cecil. If you don't pay up, I'll be forced to liquidate your assets. And you'd be well within your rights, too. Cecil tries to raise the money. Is that you? Hello, boy. How you doing, son? How are you? Haven't heard from you in a long time. Funny is you never call except as when you want something from us. What do you want this time? 
I'm in a jam, Mom, up to my ears. I need $100,000 and I need it fast. 100,000 smackerinos? You got it. I got it and I'm gonna keep it. We got a hot set in the condominium in Retirement City. Is that your final word on the subject? No, my final word is goodbye. Is this the bank? Uh, may I speak to the loan officer? Yes, this is Victor B. Heartless, the loan officer. What can I do for you? I want to take a loan. How much? A hundred thousand dollars. He hung up on me. Down to my last dime. There's only one more call I can make. Sisney calls the loan shark at the aquarium. <laughs> Smiley Barracuda here, the poor sucker's friend. I need money, and I need it fast. How much, and what can you give me for collateral? I need $100,000, and I don't got no collateral. Things don't look good. I'm really sweating this one. <sighs> Two days later, Sisney faces fiscal. Well, Sisney, do you have the money? No, but but me no but. You've had your chance. I'm going to have to liquidate your assets. You, your wife, your kids, your house, and all your belongings will be sold to the highest bidder so that payment will be made. We're closing the books on you, Sisney. Oh, no. Not that, Your Majesty. Please have patience with me. I'll pay you every cent, but don't ruin me. I'm only human. Please have patience. Pity, put yourself in my place. My poor innocent wife, Bonnie Jean, and my children, Leslie and Disney Sisney. Why make them suffer? My heart was always in the right place. I always intended to pay you back. Put yourself in my place. Stop, stop, get up. Please, I can't stand to see a grown man grovel. You're breaking my heart, I forgive you. I forgive you. I'm writing the dead off as a loss. Now, get out of here. Go home, Sisney. Go home to Bonnie Jean. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Let me kiss the hem of your garment. Cut it out, Sisney. You're making me sick and my ankle's wet. So ishy. <laughs> Go out and grovel someplace else. I'll never forget this. As the fates would have it, Sisney meets up with Stanley Poor outside the palace. I'm debt free. Oh, I'm debt free. Ooh. Oh, what's that? Do my eyes deceive me? <gasps> yes, it is. It's Stanley Poor. And he owes me a dollar eighty-five. Oh, you miserable rich. You owe me a dollar eighty-five. If there's one thing I hate, it's a four-flesher. Nick, <clears throat> you Welsher. You four-flusher, you no-pay. What's the matter with you? Have you no pride? You're lower than a snake. I'm sending you to jail. You can work it off in debtor's prison. Oh, Mr. Sisney, please have patience with me. I'll pay you back every cent. Don't ruin me. I'm only human. Please have pity. Think of my wife and my children. They're so poor they can't even afford names. Put yourself in my place. I beg. I'm begging you. I'm begging. Anyone who forgives a debt is a sucker, and I'm no sucker. No one calls Cecil C. Sisney a sucker. You're going to the pokey, Stanley Poor. Meanwhile, word gets back to the king. Oh, 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 from the street, Cecil City, whom you just pardoned, who owed you a hundred and thousand smackers, has just thrown Stanley Poor into debtor's prison over a debt of a dollar eighty-five. Cecil City says, and I quote, anyone who forgives a debt is a sucker. What does that make me? If the shoe fits, wear it. So long, sucker. hi -yo, slivers, away! Who was that masked rider? Sisney gets it. Yes, my king, you sent for me anything I can do for you? Any little favor? Any little errand I can run? You've been so good to me and mine. I never forget anyone who's been so good. Quiet, Sisney. You owed me $100,000 and I forgave you the whole amount because I took pity on you. 
Now, I hear that Stanley Poor owes you $1.85, and you had him thrown in jail. Where's your compassion? Where's your forgiveness? But that was different. Because you're not a sucker, and I am, is that it? You don't understand. Yes, I do. I'm having you delivered to the tormentors, and they'll torment you till you pay. But I can't pay up. Then they'll torment you. Put him in the box and release Stanley Poor. And everyone lived happily ever after, except Cecil Sisney. So that was the parable. What do you think was the point? All right, I'll give you 10 seconds, and then I'll tell you what Jesus said. Okay, Jesus said that just as Sisney was punished by the king, so will my heavenly father do to you if you refuse to truly forgive your brothers and your sisters. And that means everyone, everywhere, all the time. Well, it's time now to revert and go ape. Goodbye! CBS News has presented Marshall Efron's illustrated, simplified, and painless Sunday School. I guarantee you, you'll wind up in jail. Let's go practice being ankle chained together. And when Jenny gets a proposition, what will Allie do? Don't rush me. I'm not Dr. Ruth. Kate and Allie. Then it's a special one-hour episode. I can tell this is going to be a classy story. Designing Women, Monday. This is CBS. <laughs>